Dr. Menon, thanks a lot. And it's an um, easy process when you have a mentor like you who can see the future, who train how to do things, and who train how to think. And uh, uh, that is one thing which we learned a lot. Coming from Michigan to any other place was very traumatic for me, but it turned out good for the career standpoint. But the amount of time I spent in Michigan just talking to him, and this just talking to him, I think has been the biggest mentorship which anyone can have. Every weekend we will walk by the lake or we will talk on the phone. And that we have continued even today because at 6 in the morning we both are in the same time zone and we get onto the phone together. He will be in his car. He still has to work on his Bluetooth, but uh, because uh, Bluetooth, because he has a convertible. And, and, and that, that is the only reason, but we talk every day and um, that gives us ideas. We, that is one thing I really miss going to Cornell. I don't have anyone else to talk to just like, and then we'll start with the question and we'll slowly, slowly, slowly. So this talk is uh, actually Dr. Menon dedicated to you because uh, I have never talked about the genes and uh, these things before. So this has been my recent evolution in looking at the prostate cancer from a more uh, scientific standpoint. This slide uh, kind of talks about that, uh, what are the differences in the incidence and the death rates of prostate cancer. This slide actually summarizes what's happening in the United States, what's happening in the developed countries, rest of them, and what is happening in the developing world. There are a lot of biases. There are a lot of data which are missing. There are a um, lot of things which can be completed. But one thing is important. We diagnose about a million patients every year in the entire world. And I think it's an underreporting, but at least a million, million patients are being diagnosed. And in the entire world, about 258,000 people die due to the prostate cancer. So while we talk about that this is a non-aggressive cancer and all those things, it's true. But still, we are losing one-fifth of the patients in the entire world every year. When you look at the data in the United States, because of whatever right or wrong has happened, our problem is a different kind. We diagnose about 250 or 200,000 patients. Only 14% of them, they die. That could have been a good thing, but that ended up being a little bad thing. Because in order to save that many patients, we may be doing a little bit too aggressive or too many surgeries. So that is a discussion point. But look at the developing countries. About 50, there's a ratio is about 50-50. The amount of people being diagnosed and the amount of people we are losing every year, that is the problem. So I think these are two parallel words, and the real word lies somewhere in between. We don't have to do too many surgeries to reduce the mortality that much. I think we can do it without that. While diagnosing it too late when we can't do anything is also not right. So with this background, you can see that the 47% of the patients being diagnosed here, the death rates are very high. And can we change the situation? In the United States, it's common to see a New York Times, and you will see all kind of recommendations. You don't have to do PSA. Dr. Prakash Das Gupta reviewed this very scientifically, and he's right. I mean, I think the PLC or trial didn't help in this process because it was not well done. But it is out there, and we have to deal with it. But there are different recommendations going on. There are active surveillance. There is an aggressive patient. There is an mortalities are there. And this is the same group who initially talked about that no one needs in mammography. And a lot of it is tied to financials as to who pays for the screening and all those things. And sometimes um, no country will have enough number of dollars to pay for everyone who is so-called eligible for so there is this, PSA has done its job. PSA is a good marker, but there's a lot more can be done beyond PSA. And we have to kind of individualize the treatment planning and individualize the screening modality. So I want to put a face to the prostate cancer. So looking at the history. So every 100 year, we say that 19th century to 20th and 21st century we're talking about. 2,700 years ago. This was the map 
somewhere in Siberia. And the face on the left side was one of the most dreaded kings, who was a warrior, who was a king, who was a strong guy, till he was alive. Because on the right side is the same person's bone, which had been eaten up by prostate cancer. Neither me or any one of our colleagues were there 2,700 years ago, so how do we know that he died due to the prostate cancer? These bones have been studied, the genetic analysis has been done, the DNA stays sometimes, and it has been confirmed that this person, this is a strong person, the bones were so brittle that he died due to the prostate cancer. So, so this is the first ever phase of prostate cancer which has been published, and this in the recent, recent is again tens of thousands of years ago, um, thousands of years ago, that uh, this is the first ever mummy which have been ex studied and the bones you can see were totally started with the cancer. So it's been around for a long time. I was uh, listening to one of an uh, um, uh, Columbia side uh, Indian guy, Dr. Mukherjee, who wrote the um, Emperor of All Maladies, the Autobiography of Cancer, and he started with a story that uh, at the time when we were born and in Africa and how the humans uh, migrated from one place to other and what led to what, that time a lady got diagnosed with the breast cancer and how could she have been treated every hundred years differently. I want to take this story, I mean this guy who got death sentence because of prostate cancer, we have about 99% survival in the United States. So something right has happened. In that process, we may have overshot, but the course correction can happen. We all know that when we take a flight, 99% of the time when the plane is in the flight between Bombay to Delhi, 99% of the time the plane is off course. So you have to do the course correction all the time. And this is what will happen and we will get it right. So this is a talk which I'm supposed to give to the Board of Trustees to the entire Cornell University, not just the medical school. So this is a big bunch of people, quite smart people, very successful, but not necessarily the medical background. So I have updated this a little bit. And being an Indian, I had a an, uh, story to tell them. So my grandfather used to tell me stories about pre 19 in 1947, when the movement was very strong, the Britishers were still there, there was a discussion about that in Kumayu, there were a couple of tigers which had become man-eaters. And each one of them had killed about maybe hundreds and hundreds of, up to 400, 500 individuals, and there were multiple of them. And the discussion, he used to tell me all the stories that how they called Jim Carbett to get and all those things. So that story led me to kind of compare that maybe the today's prostate cancer which we are dealing with, a little bit like the tigers they were dealing in that time. And there were a lot of books written about the man-eaters of the Kumayu and the Shikari Sahib and the gentleman hunter and the, 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 this has a relevance. So I will come to this discussion a little later about Jim Carbett. So the similarity goes that India is the only country where you can see tigers. You can go to the Jim Carbet Park or Dudhwa National Park and you can see tigers and you enjoy them, you are afraid of them, but you don't have to kill all of them. So a lot of tigers are there. Some of the tigers, at least in this picture, are even toothless. They don't even have a tooth to kill. And so are the most of the prostate cancers. I would say more than 60, 70% of prostate cancers are like either this or this. But every now and then, those 240,000 which are doing bad things are like this. So there are true man-eaters out there, but they are intermingled with the rest of the tigers. And we cannot take a simplistic approach that go ahead and kill all the, cans all the tigers because uh, uh, some of them, they are man-eaters. And people also at that time used to talk about it that tigers became man-eaters Either they were genetically inclined to, but more importantly, when one of us took a shot at them, didn't do a good job, wounded them, now they cannot chase a deer, so they went for an easy prey, that was the humans. But these are the true stories, so 
we started thinking prostate cancer also becomes very aggressive when there is a genetic factor involved. And important understanding about the genetics is that I can today very strongly say that 100% of the prostate cancers are the genetic disease. 20% of that is inherited genetics. Remaining 80% is an acquired genetic changes which are happening. But in each one of them, there is a genetic mutation which is happening, which is causing the prostate cancer. And then, are we somehow wounding the prostate cancer, which is becoming more aggressive? So with this thought, we decided, while we don't have to overtreat the prostate cancer, we cannot ignore those which are going to kill 250,000 in the entire world or about. If you look at the statistics, by the time the symposium is done, about 10 people will be dead of prostate cancer. So it's not a trivial problem. So we started thinking about how can we do beyond PSA, and then if need to take care of the tiger, which is really a man -eater, how can we achieve a good surgery? So our approach has been that can we identify the aggressive cancer better than what we are doing? Can we avoid the further wounding? And then once we have to operate, can we operate for the trifecta? Um, I think Bombay people can help me what the trifecta is. Anyone knows trifecta? Where's the race course here in Bombay? Is it right? Mahalakshmi. So that's why I said Bombay guys should be able to help me with the trifecta. So when you go to the race course, you are supposed to pick up the horse which will win. And that becomes the best bet. The second, the trifecta means that you have to pick up the first, the second, and the third in the identical sequence. And that is where you say you got the trifecta. By the way, I heard a term, and maybe Prokar will vouch for, then in Ireland, the trifecta is that you have to be kicked out of three counties getting so drunk in the each bar, and you are still standing at the end of the night. So that is the trifecta in Ireland. So, with this approach, you have to think about how to best treat prostate cancer. And it may be a good time for us to a little bit look at what exactly is a genetic changes of what is a cancer. So all of you know about the cars. And uh, coming from Michigan with Dr. Menon, everything can be explained based on the cars, Mo City. So let's look at, and you are driving from here to Agra. You are in a car, and suddenly you see other trucks coming towards you, and you want to take the paddle off from the gas so that it slows down. You realize suddenly that car has an accelerator which is jammed. You are taking the parallel, but it is going 60, 70 kilometers, whatever that is, speed is, it's going on. So you worry about it. And that's exactly what is happening in a cancer cell, which is supposed to slow down after we have grown to this size, after puberty, after the embryo. There was one cell, and then suddenly the car gets stuck with the accelerator that it is proliferating in the numbers which doesn't need to. So that is the first hallmark of the cancer, that the cancer cells somehow figure out how to get their accelerators jammed. I can come up with a scientific term for that. They have an oncogene. That's truly an oncogene where the accelerator is stuck and it is proliferating more and more. So what do you do next? You try to go for a break. Great. In cancer, it is known as a tumor suppressor. Every time there is an oncogene, there is a balancing guy to break it. But they have a loose break. So those tumor suppressors are no longer working. And car is jammed with the accelerator, and the brakes are gone. And I will talk about a little bit about the brakes. When you have the foot brake gone, you have a hand brake. So same way I will talk about there is a P10 mutation, and then there is another Philip one. But they learn how to even jam the other one. And then finally, what you can do is to switch off the ignition. And that is the P53 gene, and it figures out how to. So this phenomena of a jammed accelerator and a loose brake are the two very important hallmarks of the cancer. 
The third thing which happens that, okay, if the car is not stopping, you let it run on a safe way, sooner or later it run out of the gas. But the cancer cells figure out a green revolution, they know how to generate their own energy, they become immortal. And that's another third hallmark of a cancer. Divide, 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 don't respond to the normal growth suppressors, and have an, normally when we divide multiple times, there is a chain small tail in the DNA, which is known as a telomerase, which tells, okay, you have divided enough, stop. It figures out how to overcome that signal also, so they can continue dividing without. And then finally, when in your car, all the things are going to the air conditioning, something is going to the music, something is going to the headlight, and little power is going towards the engine. Cancer cells don't worry about all those fine works, they have everything going towards the engine, car engine, so they can w go faster and faster. And when you're driving, I don't know in here, I think it's here also, we are very worried about the cops because the radars are there and they catch your speed and if you're speeding too much, you'll get a ticket. So they have a built-in radar detector that they can fool the body's immunity to not recognize that they are driving too fast. So those macrophages and the neutrophils, they come, they see and ignore it. And the worst thing is, this man-eating part of the cancer comes when you get a car in which there is a big engine, lot of speed, no brakes, and the wheels are becoming like an all-terrain vehicle. Because now it can get off the road, break through the normal barriers, and go to the other parts of the body. So the first bad thing which is happening in the cancer is that not only it's multiplying, it can now move. The mobility of a cell, the epithelial cells are all stagnant. They stay there, they grow, and they do some function. But once they start being mobile, that is this transformation known as an epithelial to a mesenchymal transformation, EMT, that this cell will go outside the prostate, this will go inside the blood vessel, they'll go through the lymphatics and go and make another colony somewhere else. So mobility is in feature, and that is what we wanted to know, that we know they are tigers already, they are multiplying and all those things. As long as they stay within the prostate, can we ignore them? So let's look at the phases. On the one side is an abnormal cell, multiplies, makes a colony, but the EMT transformation when it happens, that is when it is ready to invade. invade. We know that they were already the tiger kind. You can ignore them because they are Gleason 6 or an early cancer. But moment you start seeing signs for an EMT or an aggressiveness, and that is what differentiates. On the skin, on the face, kind. But if you look at the gene, you will know exactly what's going on. So we started mapping the cancer. For every radical, we will see exactly where the cancer, if, if it was a T3, where it was coming out, we will draw a diagram, we will collect the tissue. And can you see that this is like a rice grain? The normal rice grain is here, and you take a tissue through a needle biopsy, and guess what? There are about one million cells when you take, get that much of a tissue out. And in that one million cells, focus on this one. This is the guy who is having the EMT transformation, and this is the guy who will slowly escape. I'm not that interested in the rest of the cells. If I can see this cell, I know the bad things are happening and this patient needs something to be done. So first seven patients ever who had their entire genome sequenced, this paper was published in Nature and that was led by one pathologist from my program and another one from the uh, uh, MIT group. And you can see exactly what was happening in these patients. We started identifying a single cell, and we can now look at the single cell as to what kind of a mutation this patient is happening. And as you can see, multiple mutations were seen, but in the red are the one which are making them aggressive. At least today we know that these are the ones which are ma making them aggressive. And you can see this is an EMT cell, and one thing which we know that in order for this cell to move, it has to some mechanism which will allow them to kind of create the movement. And we, can, we are working on scanning to just pick up this movement proteins so that once we see that that is ready, that means this car is ready to get off the road. And we have to watch. I talked about the P10. I talked about the Philip. 
just this morning a paper came out which talked about the Hox gene. It may be a good idea for us to spend 30 seconds looking at this term will be thrown at us. If we are doing prostate cancer, we have to at least listen this term. There are germline mutations and there are somatic mutations. Germline mutations are the one which we have inherited because of either it came from the sperm or it came from the ovum, and we are born with that. So 20% of the 10 to 20% of the cancers have a genetic germline problem, which is causing that cancer. And in 80% of time, the genetic mutations are happening in our lifetime. So this germline mutation was seen, paper came out yesterday, that there is a 10 times more chance if you find this rare genetic mutation, the risk goes up. I can stop here or I can continue talking a little bit more. How, how am I doing with the time? We OK? So, we established that there are genetic methods in which we can find one of those six hallmarks of the cancer, and especially the hallmarks of a bad cancer, EMT, and getting off mobility part. Then we thought, can we identify beyond the genes? We already talked about the genes. Can MRI help us? So I'll just make this thing totally. So uh, what I did was out of last year when it was done, we had done about 3,000 radicals there. And out of that 3,000, we looked at the patients who possibly could have been an active surveillance patients. And active surveillance patients in my cohort is Gleason 6, three or less cores positive, none of the cores having more than 50% cancer, and their PSA should be less than 10. This was the norm. So we looked at the patient. They already had surgery. So I knew exactly what was found in these patients. And all of these patients also had an MRI scan. So those patients who possibly could have been an active surveillance patients, we looked at the MRI. And MRI are of different kind. I'm just talking about the regular prostate MRI where there is a T2 image and there are a few other kinds. The T2 is the screening part. You look at the MRI. You started with the Gleason 6, and you looked at MRI. You can't even see a one change in the entire prostate, meaning the MRI was as pristine as it gets, no lesions seen. I'm not talking about extra prostatic extension. I'm talking about that in the peripheral zone, it was this area is as normal as the other area. Where the biopsy was positive, you can't even see something. Focusing on those patients who had an invisible cancer, they had radical prostatectomy. So out of about 114 of them, I found none of only one patient who had a Gleason grade 7, 4 plus 3, one patient. And none of the patient had a Gleason 8, 9, or 10. 67, 80% of the patient stayed Gleason 6. And some of them who went upwards were the Gleason 7. Still, the primary grade was 3 plus 4, which is an early cancer. So if the MRI was invisible, there's a 1 in 114 chance that this patient will have a reasonably aggressive cancer. And this 1 in 114 had a 110 gram prostate. Central zone was so big, it was pressing on the surrounding area. So MRI was little borderline. But if you look at the next stages of an MRI, that is initial screening within T2, but there are two other ways which are known as dynamic perfusion or in diffusion weighted imaging. He was abnormal on that. So if we would have duck, just continued on this pathway, if a patient had an invisible cancer, 1% chance that this patient will have an aggressive cancer. There is no better test than this at this point to really tell you who needs treatment, who doesn't need treatment. And if it was visible, it, even then it could be Gleason 6. But that's a different story. So one thing. So one use MRI a lot to help me in deciding who needs a treatment. And this is based on our own data. As we talk about the MRIs, this MRI is going to be ready very soon. This is in seven Tesla MRI. It is done on a research basis. It's not routinely available. But you can see the level of detail which we are seeing in this MRI. By the time this becomes a norm, every person in this crowd talks about Hounsfield units for the kidney tumor, and we talk about enhancement and all those things. Two years from now, we'll be talking about the ADC values in prostate cancer and talking about whether there's a restricted diffusion or not and whether there's a perfusion increase or not. It's going to happen. 
And if you look at this approach, slowly for each 1,000 patients, I have been able to reduce the margin rate, the total margin rate, and especially in a T3 patients, the margin rate. So incremental value was there. Let's, we talked about the genetic changes, and I think I have a good feel with the imaging who has a bad cancer. Entire story started because we wanted to identify the bad guys and not touch the good guys. Gene is telling us, imaging is telling us, in a one program, you can see the margin rate surgery has become a little better. So what is the next thing we talked about? That are we going to further wound an existing tiger? So this was touched upon today by Dr. Menon, and I'll, I'll, I'll go on that. There are local aggravators. <coughs> we truly believe that <coughs> inflammation in prostate and the surrounding area is one of those local aggravators which is making things go wrong. They're an itrogenic. We know that someone is in cancer, and if we are doing multiple, multiple, multiple biopsies on that patient, there's no way I believe that it is good for the prostate. We have to figure out a better way to monitor that patient. I do biopsies, too. So I don't have a better answer. But we are working on a needle biopsies, fine needle aspiration cytologies, or in liquid biopsies. We'll talk about it. And then finally, when we talked about the single cell genomics, we can do that in the circulating tumor cells or in the urine, and possibly that will be a better marker. Right now, we are stuck. But I do think twice before subjecting a biopsy in a known cancer patient. And let's look at what possibly could be a local aggravator. And I believe that this is it. Inflammation in one thigh kind or other, either in the prostate, in the seminal vesicle, in the fat around, in the rectum, somewhere there is making the cancer go be more aggressive. There is in scientific data to say that the inflammation drives the cells to become EMT kind. It is also known as, I'll throw one term, not dwell more than that, it's known as immunoediting. Immune system is supposed to come and stop the cancer growth. Immune system is fooled by the cancer cells to start doing the things which it is supposed to, as if you somehow, the bad guys who have just robbed a bank, have convinced the cops that they have a patient in their car. So the cop's car is running ahead of them with the blinking light so that it makes things easy for them. And that's exactly what the cancer cells are doing. And this is known as an immunoediting process. And we documented that some kind of an inflammation was seen in this group of patients that aggressive the cancer likelihood that they will have some inflammation. This is a paper we are working on. The further wounding, this is a picture. This is a true picture of it in one patient. I don't have anything more than that, and this is quite controversial. So let's go for it. Now when, when we do the biopsy, biopsy goes in, comes out. You look on the right side. This is the actual tract of the scar of the biopsy, and this is an island of the cancer cells which have been pulled out in the needle tract and is now extra prosthetic. This is the area, and the cancer was out. So I can't believe that an existing, I don't have more than one slide to talk about it. Actually, I've got two. But this is not a real scientific study, but I think intuition is telling you it's, it doesn't make sense to poke in again and again. And when we looked at the Gleason aggressive cancers in a single biopsy versus multiple biopsies, they tend to have a little bit more aggressive cancers. We can pool the data and look at it. It may be totally wrong. But this is something which we are looking at. So the last thing we wanted to see, can we operate better for the trifecta? And as we talked about the cancer control, the urinary function, and the sexual function. And you have been seeing this all whole day about the surgeries of this way, one approach versus other. This is a nerve sparing, what we call a grade two nerve sparing. And This is, in my mind, the grade two nerve sparing. So I'm leaving part of the vein on the specimen.
I'm not shy in going through the wind because I think the, that gives me one extra layer of security between the margins. I'll not go with this thing too much. Bottom line is that I practice medicine in a very uh, intense atmosphere and um, we do a lot of volume. So when you do a lot of volume, people talk about it. You may be operating on patients who are so-called active surveillance more than others. So this is the data based on the publications. Pat, Gleason, seven or more. 73% of my patients in last six years have been Pat, Gleason, seven or more. And last year, they were 83.5. And I looked at those remaining 14%. Some of them just couldn't convince. Some of them had a prostate which was bigger than 75. Some of them had a very symptomatic cancer, and some of them were younger than 50 years of age, even though that is not in criteria, but it's difficult to convince someone who is around 50 to, for an active surveillance. So, but if you look at the perspective, major institutions, the second best in this was Dr. Menon's program. You were more than 65%. So, and this is a deliberate move which is happening. So at least as a robotic surgeon, we cannot be called that we are not selecting our patients right. And you can see our journey. We are doing, implementing this thing quite a bit. It is making a sense. So we identified the bad cancer. We avoided the unnecessary biopsies. We are using MRI. And when need be, we are not shy of doing surgery because we were surgeons before, so we were already hunters, if, if you go with the Jim Corbett's uh, similarities. He was only called to get hold of the bad guys. We are dealing more and more with the Gleason 8s and 9s. But he was the one who created the biggest Jim Corbett National Park so that the tigers can be safe. So we are implementing a big active surveillance program. And uh, hopefully, this will help in avoiding the overtreatment part. And uh, this is the message which I wanted to do. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I'd just like to make one, uh, one uh, comment. When you look at any disease, uh, one of the numbers that you should think about is, uh, one of the f statistics that you need to think about is number needed to treat. So um, and Ashutosh showed uh, the spectrum of diseases. Um, of, of Gleason's course in various centers. Where I trained uh, at Hopkins, it used to be that you would not operate on someone until you could guarantee them a cure. So you ended up operating on focal Gleason 6 tumors. And you could expect that the cure rate would be 100%. Again, uh, uh, these were tumors that they didn't have MRIs back then that you probably would not have, you would not have seen on an MRI. Uh, the flip side, though, is 95% of those patients would have done just fine if you had not done anything for them. So you cured 5% of patients who really needed to cure. The number needed to treat would be the inverse of 5% or 20. So NNT for treating focal Gleason 6 cancers is 20. If you go to Gleason 7s and above, and if you go to multifocal, even a multifocal Gleason 6, the number needed to treat it comes to be three to four. So for every person that you cure, you are probably over-treating three or four patients, which seems bad, but it compares very favorably to coronary artery stenting or uh, treatment of hypertension or diabetes. So, so I think uh, we're getting a lot of unnecessary flack. Uh, uh, f um, the, the, the U.S. Prevention Task Force essentially is saying there's no point in diagnosing prostate cancer early. Uh, and there's no cancer that you can say that early diagnosis is bad, but that's what the recommendation is. Early diagnosis with PSA testing is bad. Not that it, uh, uh, you, not that it should be discussed. Very clear recommendation, uh, level D, that it's bad, which uh, I think doesn't make any sense. But anyway, this is a, a great talk. Uh